get started. Uh, so I'm going to talk about designing a curriculum to meet engineering student needs. Uh, and I'm going to present my perspective and to a certain extent the, the committee that went into this, uh, the committee's perspective. Okay. So obviously this is a subjective opinion and uh, it's open for debate. So uh, I'll initially start off with, uh, with why curriculum design at all, you know, why do you need to do curriculum design? Just, just dish out courses that, that are part of an existing curriculum and do your job well and move on. You know? Uh, there are several reasons that you can give. Most of them are obvious, but it's good to just look at them, you know, refresh, refresh ourselves before we get into this exercise. Uh, the most important reason is that, is that it has to be a part of a regular introspective process. Okay, so we are engaging with students over during our teaching lives over, let's say, 10, 20, 30 years. Okay, so you can't be doing the same things that you were doing. 10, 20 years back for a variety of reasons. One is that it becomes stale. Secondly, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Third, you have to look at what the students want. Right? So it's a part of a regular introspective process, curriculum design, uh, where you look at how you've been performing, okay? look at uh, ways in which you can improve. And, uh, so curriculum plays a role there. Uh, the second reason is kind of a more market-oriented, market mercenary reason, uh, in the sense that um, this I will I will spend quite a bit of time on later. Is that the, you have to increase the relevance of what is being taught. Okay, so that's that's a very important component of especially an engineering program or a quote unquote professional program, where the idea is to train train people who can go and contribute in some section of uh, the industrial society or you know. So the 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 question of relevance comes too early in the program actually. Right. What is that? What does this get me? You know, this question comes too early in every student's uh, mind. You know, so that has to be addressed. So increase uh, relevance of what is being taught. Um, thirdly, uh, this is this is probably uh, very apparent to you as well. Uh, there is a there is a definite trend of decreasing student interest. Okay, the the uh, the relevance of of an academic program. Right is not very clear to, to students. Right? What is why are we doing all this? And I mean, ultimately, I'm going to end up in some kind of a job which which has no bearing on what I learnt. You know that those those sort of issues have led to uh, decreasing student interest. Okay, and partly also because the the role of the instructor as well as the uh, the role of the academic body as a source of knowledge is largely uh, gone. Okay, so the, the source of knowledge, I mean, having, I mean, the professor as a source of knowledge, and therefore the academic institution is the collection of professors as a source of knowledge, um, is 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 an old concept in the sense that you can you have so much access to knowledge itself that uh, I don't need to come and lecture somebody about how a, how a Wheatstone's bridge works. Okay, so. Uh, it's it's all out there. I mean, the role of a professor itself changes. Okay, so that also has a has a bearing on on, on student interest. Um, and finally, I want to uh, briefly allude to this uh, this this thing. It's a belief that if you put a good curriculum or a good structure and curriculum in place, then you enhance the learning experience both for the student community uh, as well as for the for the teaching community. So so that's a belief. So if one doesn't believe in that, then it's, it, the exercise of designing a curriculum is largely a waste. Okay, so uh, let me move on with these brief observations okay, to, uh, to the concerns that, uh, that a typical curriculum design exercise uh, should address. Okay. So these concerns are specific to the modern day environment or the current environment. Surely the concerns will change over a, over a period of time. Okay, so let me start with student concerns or student complaints. Uh, some of these complaints that you see here may be specific to the situation that I am in or I am familiar with. Uh, so there are, of course, these are these are not in any way exhaustive. Okay. So uh, we will we will have a discussion uh, shortly. Um, the student complaints typically fall in these uh, these categories uh, of uh, you know of complaints. One is that uh, there is a lack of hands-on experience. Okay. There is undue emphasis on math 
or undue emphasis on analytical details. Okay, this is a huge concern across all sections of engineering institutions. Okay, so uh, and it is a fact that our engineering institute, the, the engineering institutions in this country are woefully inadequate in terms of laboratory infrastructure. Okay, it's all a sham of an experience for for anybody involved, students as well as faculty. And we really do not do not ha have not taken concerted efforts to address this in a big way at all. You know. And it is also because of the of the of the way we are traditionally exposed to uh, to engineering and science, etc. It's through passing some exams. Okay, so the aim is to pass some exams and get into a engineering or a science program with little or no idea of uh, what it takes to conduct a good experiment, what it takes to actually build something. You know, there is there is really no emphasis at any point in time at all. Okay, so because of which the hands-on experience or the the, uh, uh, the experience in, in, in the laboratory is is pathetic okay uh, on the other side right you have books and books of uh, you know details pertaining to mathematical models which describe particular situations and associated cute problems that can be twisted this way or the other and given in lots of different exams okay so you have you have that going right and the students just keep cramming on that uh, and some of them leave with the idea that this is what engineering is about. Some of them are like, I know this is not what engineering is about, but I don't know what is in, what engineering is. Okay, so that is a common complaint among students. The uh, other complaint is uh, is is that there is this logical content being disparately addressed. Okay, uh, so let me let me uh, explain what what this thing is. Um, so typically what happens in a curriculum is that there are there are two things happening one is to organize the material or the if i may say the knowledge that a stu undergraduate student needs to get out with right so organize that knowledge uh, in some sections okay so you compartmentalize that knowledge in some sections which are convenient for dissemination right uh, for for instruction right you say the first year you will do science courses and then the second year you will do these sort of courses and I, you will do this course in this semester and that course in some, some other semester because I can't teach in this semester and you can teach this semester etc. So there are a lot of convenience related issues which dictate how the organization of a structure goes about right. And so how you ultimately arrive at a, at a course structure and this is not something that the student wants okay? uh, because the student is left to make all these links okay? and, and the instructor sometimes the instructors themselves don't, don't know all the links right so they are themselves fooling around and they have their own uh, own pockets which they are comfortable with but ultimately the student experience gets gets affected because of this because you are just presenting different things that i need to go through this i need to go through this right each instructor keeps coming and presenting things but where is the link of uh, and Sometimes the smarter students tend to see that you know actually this could have been done in a better fashion somewhere else in the curriculum, etc. But the fact is that a lot of people are left uh, with no clue about links between different things that they've learned through the program, okay? And and they are left to make these links themselves. And I, I would think this is probably the most serious concern, even more serious than the lack of hands-on experience, okay? So because of which. Uh, an engineering situation or a situation that presents itself where you have to apply uh, ideas that you have learned in your engineering program right you are not able to organize yourself in a fashion where you, you are able to cogently analyze the problem you know you first tend to compartmentalize this you know so i want to uh, okay so this is this is looking like something is breaking so i have to use something related to strength of materials i mean that, that sort of compartmentalization comes immediately without ha with your without an ability to look at the problem holistically i mean that is in one sense because of this this problem of logical content being dispar disparately addressed uh, third issue is of course overload you know six courses a semester if anybody is serious about learning i mean it's 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 a real overload okay uh, most of us cannot through, sit through any more six courses a semester okay you go from one class to the other every every day it is going to be a real it's, it's a real tax on on uh, on the brain if, if one one needs to do a good job of, of the learning okay so there is course overload then there is repetition of material because because uh, instructors teach what they know 
right? Not what the students want to know. And uh, lastly, the program structure is rigid. And so most of the student complaints kind of were organized into into these these uh, these bullets. So the rigid program structure has both sequencing of courses. Okay, so when you do what course, and that I have to do this course only at this time, right? Uh, let me point, uh, go to the faculty complaints. I mean, these are also very, very important. This just not talk only about the students. So the, so the teaching community has the following complaints: uh, abysmal levels of interest. Okay. So uh, this is becoming increasingly uh, demotivating to to faculty members who see uh, hundred hundreds of students in front of them, eighty percent of which are not interested. Everybody knows that. The student knows that. Faculty knows that. You just go through the procedure, right? So you see some 20, 30 percent sleeping and the rest are all doing their own thing. And then you have a few bright and enthu ones who are, uh, who are participating, right? So, but, but it is a fact that the levels of interest are, are uh, seriously low. Uh, the, the second point I want to talk about is too many extra, extracurricular activities or distractions. I mean, this is a, this is kind of a, you know, fatherly view if I might say you know, to doing too many too many things which are not supposed to be uh, done by a student but the fact is that at least in in a setting like this there are there are a huge number of extracurricular activities that students want to participate it's an age where you want to you want to do all that you have incredible energy and that do uh, that does affect what what you end up doing in uh, in the class as well so if you're staying up right through the night you know, doing, uh, you know, painting one hostel wall or something like that, you're not going to be in a position to come and listen to what is happening in the next, uh, next day's class. Okay. Rampant plagiarism, okay. So this al also I think is, is, is familiar to most people. Given an opportunity, a large percentage of the class will, will copy, right. And uh, this is not, uh, this is not specific to any one college or anything, it's, it comes from uh, basic lack of understanding of why you are here. Okay? So that translates in a variety of ways. So rampant plagiarism is, uh, and poor output, okay? so projects and term papers, uh, term papers is just, uh, or if you want to do a review of, uh, of a problem, right? you want to go and search on what has happened or, uh, or, or uh, deal with a problem, do an honest investigation. Most of the time, it's some cu cut and paste work from some from some sites. No understanding. Just put some material here and there and present it as you know something that you have done. Okay. So uh, these are the the, the complaints with, that we uh, we sought to address. Uh, just so that I don't make this a monologue and say what we have done. So l let's get some some opinions on any other things. That you uh, that you from your experience have seen uh, as concerns that that are partly related to the curriculum, right? Um, both faculty and student concerns. Any any ideas that you may have that are not really captured here, feel free to share that. Large number of students. Large number of students. Yeah, it's a faculty concern that that has not that's not been put here. Student concern. Hmm. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I I mentioned that briefly in the pre previous set of slides. But yes, that's that. If if you had to pick two things, I would I would say that there is no uh, no link between different things that you learn, and secondly, the the lack of relevance or the la perceived lack of relevance of what you what you are doing. Okay. So, are you going to come to industry concerns? Uh, sure. There, there. I am not going to talk about industry concerns here. That's the main concern. What? Hmm. Industry. Uh -huh. One who will use this raw material. Right. If the student does not learn this bit or which is not able to get across, right. it's industry concern. Right. It's a raw material children to industry. Right. So if that concern has not been addressed, uh -huh. then the curriculum is going to be out of focus. Yeah, so uh, the stakeholders typically are, are the students, the faculty, the industry, the alumni, right? A lot of people involved. Okay, so uh, the the kind of captive audience for stakeholders to, to get feedback from are students and faculty, right? The industry feedback that we, we obtained was not through an extensive survey, but through a lot of um, one-off opinions of, of, uh, of speakers who came here, of industry leaders. So those were subjective opinions, not, not uh, surveys that were conducted. Okay? So we did, we did go through the process. 
I will briefly talk to you about some of those things, which, which again are obvious, but just uh, just point that out. But yes, we did we did do that exercise. Yeah. Uh, we tried to do this exercise at our institute. Yeah. Force that is engine mechanics. So right. Very basic force. Hmm. So there is one more concern which may not come into any of these two categories, and hmm. that is that of the faculty. Faculty who were teaching that course for several years, hmm. they are not ready to change that stuff because then they will have to require to. You know, uh, do all the thing again and again. So that would come somewhere. You know. uh, uh, yeah. So, it, it, not ready to that yeah. So uh, I would say that is a student complaint that you keep dishing it, dishing the same things out. Yes, the quality of faculty I have not put here. Okay. <laughs> so all this doesn't make sense if you don't have quality faculty. That's uh, if you. That is a kind of. See, if if a faculty is not going to uh, is not willing to do that, then curriculum design is just out out of the scope. You, know, you just throw this away. Uh, a few more remarks. The last remark kind of alludes to what you had uh, you had raised. Uh, so I will start with that. There is a rapid change in the environment of the outside world, right? Uh, so the workplace has become increasingly information rich. There is a lot of information. What is required is the ability to interpret that and make make good decisions. Okay, and typically these days employers seek multiple domain competencies. Okay, so you uh, you get out with, uh, with with a degree in mechanical engineering, knowing how to solve F equal to MA sort of problems, right? And and doing that well, right? You typically are not going to find a job that that you know rewards you in 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 some sense. Okay. So uh, typically employers these days are looking at people who have not only core competence or uh, not only knowledge about one area, but I mean just gen general feel of how things work. You know, so this is this is something that we got repeatedly uh, as part of our polling the the industry industry folks. Okay, so we want we want people who are more well rounded. You know, not not just specialists or uh, not straight jacketed people. A few, a few more remarks. The current programs uh, are perceived by the industry, right, uh, as straight jacketed with little flexibility. Okay. So, uh, and they have mentioned that this, this is something that you can address. So, if you, if you remove that straight jacketing, things may become a little easy, a little better. You know, or the product that you, you get out will be a little better. Okay. And the, the first remark that I put out here. <coughs> And students feel students feel that they are ready to take charge of their careers. I mean, you they don't need you to you to come and say this is what you need to do. Many of them have have thoughts. I mean, uh, and this is this is a, this is a trend. I think which is associated with the uh, kind of level of confidence of of youth in India, right? Things are things, there, there is a general perception that things are getting better, right? So uh, and there is a lot of information. I can make my own decisions. So that is that is in, in some uh, some sense affecting uh, you know uh, the way uh, the way students receive something rigid some some rigid curriculum that you impose on them and just because they are captive for four years or three years or whatever the case may be uh, the undergraduate community they have to listen to you otherwise they don't get the degree that's the only reason they listen to you most of the time right it's not 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 out of any other reason okay so. Uh, st st this this perception among students also need to be addressed. Okay, so uh, it is something that is, in my opinion, good. Somebody is 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 has the um, confidence to say that yes, I'm going to ch take charge of what what I'm going to end up being is good, and we have to address that. And if you don't address that, you're going to again face the situation of repression of this guy wants to do something and you want to do something else because you've been doing that for a long period of time. Okay, so. You need to be uh, you need to be a little nimble nimble footed. I just wanted to add there yeah. that basically the attitude to change you are seeing is because these students have now got a more of an entrepreneurial streak. Once right. Upon a time it was a, I want to be employed somewhere. Right. And today you are all going to be single office, single home, office, that type of attitude. Right. The entrepreneurial streak is coming up. We, need, we want to pick up things fast and become your own boss. Correct. Yeah. We are looking at employment as a priority. Right. Yeah. This, this, this is very true that people uh, people who want to take charge of their lives and you know who want to who want to do things and 
there is a perception that India now is increasingly offering these opportunities, right? And that is filtering through the students. They see all, they see examples of that, big examples, small examples, you know, all of that. So they also want to be, I mean, they have role models to look up to now. Uh, so uh, from now on, I'm going to describe the uh, the kind of the thinking uh, thinking process of the of the of the committee that I was part of. Right? Uh, so we uh, we did the following. We looked at immediate challenges, okay, how they need to be addressed, and um, also defined an approach on how we are going to address the challenges. Okay. So uh, so the immediate challenges uh, were low motivation among students for academic work. So this has to be addressed. Uh, the disillusionment with the quality of the academic programs, especially hands-on and lab work, okay, and the perception of disconnect between academic program and the career prospects, okay. These we identified as the as the key things. So if you, if you address this, you are probably doing a pretty decent job, okay. And what we uh, also observed that uh, these uh, these three issues led to a small number of academically motivated students, swamped by a huge uninterested majority, okay. So. And this plays a big bearing on how the small number of motivated students are going to, um, I mean, are going to go through the academic program. Because a lot of what happens in uh, in the undergraduate years is is driven by peer pressure. Okay, uh, I mean, the herd effect is phenomenal in the uh, in the undergraduate world because you don't want to be left out uh, for for any reason, either social acceptance or. Uh, financial remuneration or f future prospects, or you don't, you you think that the decisions you are making right now are, are really the, really important, and therefore you don't want to be left out in any, any way. So if you see a large majority of students who are just doing their own other things are not 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 pertaining to academics per se, then you start wondering what the hell you are doing. Okay, so you I mean there is there, there is this. Uh, peer pressure on, on the academically motivated students to not not be academically motivated. Okay, um, and associated with that is the packed uh, extracurricular calendar. This may be very specific to the IIT Bombay scenario, but I, I, I guess it will be true in in, a, in in many other situations. Okay, so this these three issues we wanted to address immediately. Okay. Uh, we wanted to take a kind of a positive approach. We didn't we didn't think that these were were issues that you know uh, that were against what we wanted to do, right? This is not something like we felt like, oh, these these students think that the academic program is useless. They don't know what they are doing. I mean, that sort of an approach is kind of distancing yourself from the problem even further. Okay, so if you if you if one takes that approach, then it defeats the purpose of actually doing an exercise where the whole curriculum is more rewarding. Okay, so the approach we took is. Uh, is is an approach of looking at opportunities that we have to make uh, this learning experience more reasonable through a curriculum change. Uh, one thing we uh, observed and we took that as an opportunity is that most people felt we are in a crisis situation. If you if you ask the IIT faculty members who have been here for like 20, 30 years, all, all of them will say that you know 20 years back we had students who were, who were so good and uh, these days we don't have guys who are so good. People are not interested in listening to our lectures. We have to impose an attendance rule and things like that. Uh, so it is perceived that the situation that that we are in is, is a crisis situation. I mean, if you don't address it over the next five, ten years, you are going to largely lose the student population. So uh, more and more of of the tutorial classes will start, and the academic entities will just be just be degree giving entities with with no uh, no faith in what they are doing. You know. So we didn't. Uh, so we a lot of people felt that this is a crisis situation, and that has made them receptive to I new ideas. Okay, so this is an opportunity that we wanted to exploit uh, because uh, this sort of curriculum uh, uh, redesign exercise has been proposed in this institute several times in the past. Okay, so some minor modifications were made, but this is the first time that any serious, significant philosophical modification has happened, and that's because. Uh, we think mainly because of the stakeholders or the faculty community especially were, were receptive to new ideas. Okay. Uh, and we also recognize that few real conceptual changes to curriculum design have, have happened in engineering education institutions. Uh, the second opportunity that we noticed was that the curriculum design itself provides an opportunity to sustain student enthusiasm and I'll, I'll, I'll point out uh, to this later. So what we felt that 
let the student take, I mean, the, if the student wants to take responsibility, let the student take responsibility. Why are you, you know, uh, straight jacketing some program for the student and, you know, making the student go through that, right? And we've been able to do that through a, a, a variety of measures. So I will, I will point to that later. Uh, and the third thing we want, wanted to focus on, or the opportunity is that we want to get out of this in, instructor-centric dissemination of a curriculum. Okay, so uh, uh, what do I mean, mean by this? The, the instructor plays a central role, no, no doubt about that. But the instructor is not the sole entity through which the student gains knowledge or learns, learns how, to, uh, how to look at a problem. Okay. So uh, the, the, role of the, uh, the role of the instructor uh, being, being the sole, uh, sole authority as far as that subject or you know, uh, course is concerned, we wanted to get, get out of that. Okay, so give, give students a, a chance to decide that. Maybe the, for some students the instructor is, is the most important authority. For some other students the instructor is just uh, somebody who can, who he can bounce ideas from, to and from. Right, so uh, we wanted to, uh, so we said that this is an opportunity. So curriculum design provides an opportunity for us to, to, uh, to do something good. Okay, so let me move on to the new curriculum. So I'm just going to, uh, spend a, a few minutes on the philosophy of the new curriculum. Okay. The details are not a, as important. There are two aspects to this philosophy. One is that we said we are going to have fewer more intense courses. So we are going to, uh, in, in some sense, cut the number of courses that your uh, student has to do because there are too many context switches. So what do I mean by context switches? I, I go sit in this class and suddenly, so, so, so it's maths and suddenly I'm going to humanities, then I'm going to do a class in, in electrical circuits. And there are a lot of context switches because of which there is no serious attention paid to anything. Okay. So you just, just keep going one from one place to the other. So we wanted to reduce the number of context switches and make the courses themselves more, more intense. And if you really look at it, if each, if each one of us were to write down uh, the set of courses that, that for example, uh, let's say electrical engineering. Okay. Uh, so each one of us has a perception on what an, what an undergraduate electrical engineer needs to know when he or she graduates. And if you list down the set of ideas, the set of abilities, the set of uh, the skill sets that the person needs to leave with, you will see that you don't need 25 different courses for that. If each one of us were, were to lay this down, okay, then the number of ideas that are there, in a, the new ideas that are there in a course are typically two, three, maybe four. That's, that's, the, that's the total number of ideas, total number of ways of looking at a problem. The rest is all, you know, specifics associated with the problem. Developing the skills and ability to, or the, developing uh, the jargon, you know, to be able to communicate to other people who have gone through the uh, similar course, right? So we wanted to reduce the context switches and focus on the main essentials. Okay, so uh, fewer more intense courses we thought will do that. And we evolved, we evolved something called the basic minimum program. It's not called the basic minimum program. It's just called a BTEC, uh, which, uh, which addresses this, this issue. So there are a la there is a drastic reduction in the number of courses. I will come to, come to that uh, a, a little later. But they, they will hopefully be delivered in a more intense fashion. Okay, uh, this also accommodates, uh, so if you have fewer courses, it accommodates students who are having trouble going through the program. You know, uh, if you have six courses a semester, somebody fails a course, it's usually difficult for the guy to, uh, you know, maneuver the, uh, maneuver the program without some external help. And he'll go and say, sir, sir, please, please allow me to take this, this extra course with you so that, you know, uh, I can do it without having to repeat the course again, etc. There are lots of such requests that keep coming for people who are not able to, uh, you know, go through the program without, without, let's say, failing one or two courses, okay. So, and there is no, there is no problem. If you fail a course, you do it again. So, you should, you should give the uh, flexibility to the, to the student to do that, you know. So, I think this uh, minimum program does that as well because there are fewer courses. So, if you fail one, you can always cover it later. Okay, uh, the second aspect of it is, I think, the kind of crowning glory of the program is, uh, is that we wanted to give more freedom to the student. Okay, so we have introduced a whole host of uh, measures that will provide that, that freedom. Okay. Uh, the first measure that I want to talk to you about is a minor option. Okay, so, so we have 
so the minor option is that you provide the student an opportunity to do a set of courses which may be termed what is what is called a, as a minor in an area which is different from what he has been saddled with. Uh, the, the student who typically passes 12th standard has some idea of the maths and science courses. Uh, is not really in a position to, uh, to make a judgment on what sort of engineering or what sort of programs he or she likes. You know, you get into a program for whatever reason, because of your rank, because of your marks or whatever. Somebody tells you uh, IT is very good, you get into computer science or something like that. Okay. So uh, the minor option is, is a way for the student to exercise choice on investigating a set of courses or going through a set of courses that he or she perceives as interesting. Okay, it may be anything uh, the student wants to do. The packaging of these courses is left to the, uh, to the academic machinery. Okay. So for example, I may be a student in, uh, in electrical engineering and uh, I may want to know something about or I like planes, I like things that fly or for whatever reason. I want to do a set of courses in aerospace. So the aerospace department will decide that if you do this set of courses, we, your transcript will give you credit for having done that and you can explore it and there is no penalty if you don't if you do a couple of courses there and you decide that you don't want to do it fine it's, uh, it's that that's fine it's just that you will not get something in your transcript so this minor is something that is outside of your department that you could do uh, uh, and you know be, be rewarded for having uh, taken the taken the initiative okay so that that's one thing we've done the second is that uh, actually this is not a, not supposed to be a major option, it's supposed to be an honors option. For those students who are academically motivated and by chance they have landed in the department that they end up liking, right? So give them the opportunity to really showcase their, their interest, okay? So uh, the way we have done that is that you will distinguish those students who have taken extra initiative to participate in the academic activities of let's say mechanical engineering, okay, by giving them an honors degree. Okay, so BTEC with honors. So they have done something extra and what this honors means is, is left to the department. Each department decides what, what would constitute an honor. So now the student has options. If you don't want to do any of this and just want to like chill out, I mean I am not set for engineering. A lot of, lot of students are like that. They come into engineering because of their competence in being able to solve some science math problems. They decide that I, I don't want to do all these things. Okay. So I have other interests. Um, and I want to get, I want to still get a degree because a degree fetches me a job. Okay, this is the reality of today. So it's okay to be. You are saying it's okay to be like that, provided you go through the basic minimum program. Okay, so go through the basic minimum program. You have you have free time. If you go through it well, you have the free time to do whatever you want. And we are not going to we are not going to come and impose anything on you. Okay, and we have also provided provided some freedom in the sequencing of courses. It's not required that you have to do this now and in the first semester and that in the third semester and so we have also provided that sort of flexibility. Okay. So in philosophy, fewer more intense courses and more freedom to the student. This is what the, the guiding philosophy of what we did was. Okay. Uh, this is the question that somebody raised, you know, did you just do this yourself or did you take into account what the stakeholders thought? So we did a, this is the result of the ME survey, we have done this survey for every department for about uh, totally about 25 to 30 percent of the student community has participated across all all uh, all year sections across all um, uh, marks or grade point sections okay so there we have done this extensively uh, so this is a sample result uh, so 80 percent of the of the respondents claimed that these these the, these sort of changes is um, are are welcome fewer more intense courses. Uh, students be provided the option to plan out their own study schedule, lab component included as part of the course, okay, and ele electives from a spectrum of departments. So, we, so electives or minor, okay. So we we'll address that through the minor program. Uh, also, just just to get a sense of how the how the students think the current program is doing. Uh, any students thought that 50% of them thought the program is doing poorly. Current program. And 40% of them think it is doing okay, needs some improvement, and 10% think it's doing really well. Okay. So this is 
usually you get an anti establishment sort of uh, response when you say when you ask students how is it doing uh, very bad you know, whether it's good or bad it's, it's all, the response is always like that but i mean they have been honest you know uh, and just to give you a flavor this is some specific flavor uh, flavor we've uh, organized uh, what is going to be delivered to the students in the basic minimum program into five different or five or six different groups uh, one is the science and math the basic science and math component what we have introduced is, uh, or this was already uh, always there, this basic engineering focus was there, but we have introduced a couple of things there which, uh, which you, may, you may be interested in. One, uh, one is this course on data, so this basic engineering course, a set of courses in basic engineering, every student has to go through. Okay? Every student that go, that's go, becoming an engineer through this process has to go through this. And what we said was that every student has to go through a program or go through a course in data analysis and interpretation. Okay. So whether you are an engineer or whether you are um, I mean, any, anybody who is dealing with, uh, with, with data right, or with, uh, dealing with numbers right, is usually uh, disordered with problems associated with how do you interpret the data, what, what sense can you make out of it. A large number of engineers end up doing, doing just this in their lives. In their, in their professional lives. Huge number of Excel sheets with a lot of data from a lot of different sources and then you have to figure out what is happening. Okay? Whether, whether you are a marketing guy or a sales guy or an engineer or who is actually doing technical work, this is something that a lot of people end up doing and we said that we don't have an explicit way of addressing that at all. Right? So data analysis and interpretation. So what are the sort of questions you are going to um, answer here. It, typically, you are doing going to do statistical hypothesis testing, right? So you have data, have a has a have a statistical hypothesis, and you are going to find out if it makes sense to make the hypothesis or not. Okay. Uh, the second thing is on experimentation and measurement. We wanted to explicitly say that every engineer that goes through this program should know how to measure basic physical variables. Okay. This ability is not there, by the way, currently. Not every engineer knows, knows this. So uh, the ability to design experiments, okay, that is a, I would say, a higher ability. But the ability to just measure, measure things and report. Okay. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Suppose I wanted to measure temperature in some location of this this uh, uh, this room. I should not only know what to what to stick in there, but actually measure it and give you a result. Okay. So not just say that I will put a thermometer there. You know. Or if I, most students, it, it's really sad, you ask them I, I, at the end of their course, uh, mechanical engineering students, um, how do you measure torque? Okay. Most, most people say torque meter. Get a torque meter and stick it in there. Okay. So how do you measure pressure? Uh, something will be there, pressure meter. Right. So everything just, just ends up being, you know, I'm sure there will be something, I will just take that and put it in here without understanding how it is actually done and the ability to actually measure things. So uh, experimentation measurement, everybody going through that is, is something something that we have said has to be done. Okay, so we have, uh, just to point out a couple of things, we have a, a few more of such, uh, such courses. Uh, and the, the departmental core itself actually has been cut down to a certain extent. Okay, so we are going to have about 13 to 14 courses so whatever you want to package, you uh, in your if you want to give a glimpse of mechanical engineering to undergraduate students, do that in 13 courses. And usually that is plenty. You if you really do a good job of organizing your content, um, and you increase the number of electives or the spectrum of things that students can choose from. And the recommended load per semester, according to the committee, is uh, four lecture-based courses and two lab-based courses. Okay, so you're not going to do six courses. Uh, so, in case you fail something, you have an opportunity to do it later. Okay, and we are not going to uh, entertain requests that please, 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 no backdoor entries into into the program. You failed once, uh, doesn't matter. You do it one, do it, do it again, but do it well. Okay, so uh, that's what we came up with, and uh, this is the the, the last slide. Uh, I hope it was wasn't like too centric to what we had done, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of the sort of issues that we looked at and also the, the considerations that went behind the design of the structure and uh, what we have, uh, I, I guess the biggest success of the committee is, is, is in fact it has co uh, convinced both the student and the faculty body 
at large to accept this program and it is in place now it's not just a proposal so the current first year students are going through this program and the students from years to come will at least for another 5 10 years i guess will go through this program let me tell you what a credit means in our uh, in our context a credit is a notional value of the number of hours that a student spends per week okay so if i say one credit then the student spends one hour per week on that on that so if a course is six credits the expectation is the students the student spends one uh, six hours per week on that so usually it is a three hour of a classroom sort of lecture based interaction and three hours hopefully of of something the student does right so that is that is what a credit thing is and we said that no semester in the in the basic minimum program no semester will require the student to spend more than 40 credits uh, so which means that more than 40 hours a week okay so the, there is the basic minimum program has a kind of unwritten cap of 40 hours a week so no semester we have uh, more than 40 credits uh, the philosophy behind that is that if you're doing a good job of 40 hours a week of work no matter where you are whether you're a professional whether you're a student you you will come out with with something good okay so that that was the guiding idea there but if some student really wants to overload for some reason you know i want to do this course desperately then we we will give leeway let's say 42 credits 45 credits but um, there is no strict cap on on that you know maybe maybe beyond 48 the <laughs> academic body is going to say no you have to do only that uh, there are two courses that we are saying one of the things that has happened in this program which the humanities department is not very happy with at least some of them is that we had three courses earlier uh, belonging to the humanities this thing we have chopped that down to two now uh, this is in the basic minimum program but if indeed some someone wants to there is so much flexibility now that if you are interested in humanities you can you can just go ahead and take courses there is nothing that prevents you from uh, from taking courses and in fact some of the department guys are also upset that we have knocked their uh, portion down because they were teaching 19 20 courses of mechanical engineering uh, for ages so that's become 13 all of a sudden so uh, this grouse is there but the answer to that is that you have the flexibility regarding what is going to be taught in humanities one course is the humanists may not really consider humanities is on economics uh, the uh, other other course we are giving flexibility to the student right to explore whatever the uh, student wants to explore there is a basket of things that uh, students can take uh, take from but other than that the humanities department is going to offer uh, right now they're saying that there may be one or maybe two minors so students can graduate with btech in whatever engineering and a minor in humanities okay or minor in economics even or minor in i don't know whatever right so uh, that is that is happening so right now the departments are evolving their minors so uh, the idea is that see this whole program or the basis for the structure this structure will all fall flat if we find nobody taking minors okay then i then it's it's clear indication that you, no matter what you do <laughs> the students don't want to do uh, want to go through this program but if indeed the minor becomes like a uh, you know uh, a popular thing then i think we we've, we've really done a good job of providing the opportunity to, to the students to you know go and explore what they want you know in the in the context or in the with the limited set of things that we have okay so uh, hopefully that will really take off this elaborate on this four lecture based courses and two lab based courses because in engineering hmm. normally theoretical subjects are always associated with the lab program right so uh, how do you uh, split it or what exactly is that uh, the, the, the way we are, so if you look at, look at it there, uh, we are saying about 13, so if you want to capture mechanical engineering, you have to do it in 13 or 14 lecture based courses, that is, you, you can even call it theory, but it's basically lecture, like I am doing right now, and 9 courses which are going to have laboratory, significant laboratory con content. Okay, so not all courses will have a laboratory associated with it. So for example, if you are teaching solid mechanics, okay uh, you may not have a laboratory but solid mechanics and strength of materials let's say in mechanical engineering will will have one laboratory associated with it so what we are saying is that each each semester you go through at least two laboratory courses 
in, in the program. So you end up doing between 12 to 16 laboratory courses in your program and four lecture days. So uh, in, the, in the latter part of the program, that is uh, in the second and the third years, uh, I shouldn't call it latter, in the second and the third years, you will typically have two or three lecture based courses from the department and two lab courses coming from the department and you have that one uh, one course will will, uh, will allow you to you will have to take it either from you know uh, from an elective or from let's say from humanities or wherever it is from okay so that will uh, that will be the general flavor of how it is organized but these two courses uh, will or these two or three courses will be dictated by the department and uh, the lab courses also will be dictated, what lab courses they will do will be dictated by the department. But the point is that 4 plus 2, so we don't want too much overloading beyond that for the basic program. For those who can really go about doing it well, go ahead, you have the option. Okay, thank you.